What is up, everyone? Uh, today I was working in the shop and got so many emails and text messages and Instagram messages and Facebook messages. Um, I don't mind that you guys message me. Um, a lot of you guys just message really silly stuff, but uh, I do get a lot of emails about alignment stuff. Um, so I'm gonna answer the best I can to get you a good baseline to start from and have you understand a little bit of what's going on when we do that. Um, so I'm gonna dive right in and give you guys some tips um, for alignment stuff. So this is saying, we're starting this off by saying your car already has a ride height that it needs to be. Um, so whatever you think is comfortable, I don't wanna get into an argument on what ride height is and why it's so important and whatnot because there's a style aspect to that and a lot of you guys want your car super low um which is fine i think that's sick and cool um, obviously from a competitive level it doesn't always work that way just because of the constraints that we have to work in but i think for the most of us in fd if we could have a really low car we would all have a really low car <laughs> it just doesn't always work that way um then uh, you don't have the car super raked forward or back. And when I say super raked, I mean like visually like two inches of ride height difference. So if you have an inch of brake reverse forward, whatever, all good. Um, but just, this is, uh, just stating that you've already got your ride height set. You've already got your tire sizes, your, all that stuff. And we can talk about that all in another video. This is going to be strictly for just basic alignment stuff. Um, and the whole goal is what I'm going to tell you guys today is how it's going to baseline your alignment, meaning like it's going to give you something that is very neutral. Um, it's going to give you something that is set up equal left to right. It's going to give you a better understanding on what you need to do when you're trying to battle something, um, or make a change that improves something, or even just understanding why your car might be doing something, uh, weird or good or bad or whatever the case might be. Um, so obviously, like I was saying, this is to baseline uh, your setup. So first most important thing is every arm on the left side of the car should be the same size side as the, or size as the right side of the car. Um, so don't, once we, before you even align a car or set anything up or do anything, when you're putting the arms on, when you're building the car, or if you bought a car that's poorly set up and you want to reset everything or maybe you screwed it up and you want to reset everything and you've watched this video and you're excited about basically diving in and now learning more so every arm on the left side of your car has to be the same as the right and vice versa obviously um, so we're going to start off with the same length control arms left and right same length of if you have a tension rod rod car same that left to right obviously these things and the cars are not perfect. So obviously there's gonna be adjustments to be made from this, but starting with it all the correct length and on the same settings and all of that left to right is key. First thing we're gonna talk about is the caster in the front of the car. Um, typically on any of these cars, uh, depending on what you're doing in drifting, you know, you could run anywhere from three to probably nine degrees of caster. Um, those six degrees of adjustment in between are very, very, very finicky on what the car does. And it's mostly how the car relates and rates to angle and also how that relates and gives you feedback to make the input. Um, a lot of guys like to run a lot of caster. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that having a lot of caster has its bonuses, uh, such as on some cars it will actually lean the wheel over a lot and create more uh, rear grip by jacking the car. Um, again, very complex. We're not really getting into that direction today because I want you to have the easiest, most reliable car to drive so that you can make adjustments from there. Um, some people like no caster and they like the wheel to basically be more flat throughout its curve and movement. Um, some people like to have knuckles that have trail, which would mean the hub location is different from the lower control arm position. Um, and that changes the steering feel as well, um, in, independently between the two of the caster and movement. Um, but generally speaking with most cars, even most suspension setups, adding caster by moving the wheel, uh, will basically um, change the strut angle of the car and the knuckle angle of the car. Um, and what that does is basically creates what's most people watching will know as self steer. Um, 
having a lot of self-steer actually works the opposite of what you would think. Um, self-steer is when you're in drift and you let go of the wheel and the wheel steers for you to help you steer the car. Um, you'll see a lot of people who drive, and I personally hate this style, but you'll see a lot of people that drive like this. And they let go, because they're, they're training themselves, and when they, when they were learning, they trained themselves to let go of the wheel, like let it do the work for you, which is great. I think you always should be letting the wheel do the work for you, especially when you're learning how to drive. Um, but it just looks ridiculous when you are doing this. Now everyone that goes drifting and watches this video is going to be self-conscious of how much they're letting go of the wheel, but I like to just let it move in my hand um, so I can feel it moving um, and be ready to slow it or speed it up if I need to. Um, obviously, if you watch my videos of me driving my FD car and stuff, there's a lot more to the equation than all of that, and I'm trying to tame something that is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, but back to the point of caster. The more caster you have in theory, which is that strut angle, that uh, knuckle angle, and the movement of the wheel forward and the wheel well, the more that you have, uh, the faster the self-steer will happen. Now, like I said, there is something that's, that is actually counterintuitive. If you have too much caster, you can actually spin out and transition and cause the car to over-rotate and transition. The, mean, the reason why is because the way it works is if the car flops to angle with the steering, it's actually flopping the whole car, right? So if you have so much caster, like you know, 8, 9, 10 degrees, obviously depending on what the actual uh, adjustment or the offset is on the ball joint, like caster trail. But if you have too much caster and the car wants to just immediately go to lock, it will always just go to immediate, immediately go to lock, which makes it much harder to drive because you're trying to drive by not spinning then instead of trying to drive to reach your maximum amount of angle. So if you have so much caster that the car is going to lock, like you can hear the wheel whack, the steering stops, and then you come back the other way, yeah, does the same thing. Obviously that could work to your style or your car or whatnot. But if you're over rotating all the time because of that, you can pull your caster back some and remove some caster. So that way it slows the wheel and then you can force it to lock so that it snaps to its 30 degrees or 40 degrees of angle and then you have to work it the rest of the way because um, that steering flop and whack left to right means that you're going to be driving trying not to spin instead of driving to achieve that angle and driving harder. Um, cars that have a lot of caster typically can't be driven super hard um, because they want to over row all the time because again by having that caster it's allowing the car to do that. Um, rather than being balanced somewhere in the middle um, to where you can drive it to that. The other thing is if you have too little caster, you'll have no self-steer. You'll actually lose steering feel throughout the steering. Um, and that's, again, a preference. Some people like to basically hand, we call it Arnie Palmer, you know, palm the wheel all the way around, right? Um, so some people like to do that. Think of it like if you've ever been snow drifting or anything, like because the wheels are planted in like a deep amount of snow, the self-steer is limited because it's actually trying to fight that drag of the snow and whatnot. So it, in theory, like I was saying, there's a balance of in between. So I would typically say start off where the car comes with caster wise. Um, so like some of the S chassis guys would be six and a half, I think degrees or something, six degrees. Um, the Miata guys would be similar. The Mustang guys would be, I think it's a tick more with the Mustangs. Um, the E36s are about five and a half degrees. Um, I would start at the factory setting. And it's not a cop out to be like, oh yeah, just put it to stock and then I'll adjust from there. But like, it's pretty centered up at that point, you know? Like, um, it's just important to get something that's in the middle and then you can adjust it. Or if you've already been driving your car and you feel like it flops and smacks to lock or what, whatnot, just try pulling a little bit of caster out. Obviously, when you adjust the caster, it's gonna affect the toe quite a bit, so make sure you're resetting the toe. Um, but that's just a quick mark on what the caster does. Now, also remembering with the caster is where your wheel is in the wheel well will affect that over-centering issue of tie rods. And over-centering of the tie rod is basically when the tie rod has reached its full extension and it basically does not match the angle of the control arm, 
ball joint and you get a spot where it's light, meaning like the wheel can wobble back and forth when you're at lock. Um, you'll see that a lot with cars that just don't have the correct steering rack placement for that amount of caster that they're running. So extreme movements of the, of the caster can cause issues with the actual um, uh, over centering of the tie rod. So keep that in mind as you're making these adjustments that if you start getting wheel wobble, you might have to move your rack accordingly. Um, also, the amount of caster that you have affects the ackerman of the car, and the ackerman is basically the difference between the lead wheel and the trail wheel. This would be like zero ackerman, this would be positive ackerman, this would be negative ackerman. Again, that's a very uh, preferenced thing, but as you adjust the caster, you're adjusting that angle between the tie rod and the ball joint, um, so you're gonna change that. So like on a E36 or a Mustang, any of these front steer cars, as you add caster, it will actually um, tow the car out more at lock. As you remove caster, it will bring it in. Um, so we're just gonna change that Ackerman setting as well. Another thing to think of, very complicated. Um, so like I said, my, <clears throat> my movement on what you should do is you should start close to the baseline of the car um, and drive it and make adjustments from there. Um, and then reset the toe between each of your caster adjustments to get the feel exactly where you want. And caster is one of those things where it works pretty much the same at every track. Like you can set your caster and you can pretty much leave it once you're happy with it. Um, it would only make a difference ever if you were going from a really, really um, big, wide, open, fast track to a very small, technical, slow speed track where you might want to change that caster to help you have more time to transition if that makes sense. But for the argument of this video and what 99% of you guys are doing, get that steering to where you're happy with. You can just release the wheel and let it do its work, but also be giving it some input so that you're still in control of it and not just letting the car drive you. Once your caster's set, the next thing is going to be your front camber. Um, obviously, there's a lot of different things and a lot of different setups here and a lot of different cars and every single thing, every single car, every single suspension design, every single everything is totally different. Um, so once you have your caster set and you're moving towards your camber, I always recommend to do the 60% rule, which is something that I don't know if I invented or not, but I've just adopted it at this point. Um, you wanna steer the car to 60% of your car's angle um, and basically set it so that there's zero camber at 60 degrees or 60% of angle. Um, if your car is stock and it has stock steering angle, I'd probably go to like 80% because um, you're gonna be driving it at about 80% of its angle all the time because you don't have that much angle. Um, but most steering kits nowadays have 55 to 65 degrees of angle, realistic angle. Um, so you wanna go at to about 60% of that. You can do that using a protractor on the ground, an alignment piece, or you can do it by marking the wheel. Obviously some steering racks are not linear. So that makes it a little bit difficult, but for the most part, uh, we wanna get it to around 60% of its angle, and we wanna set that to zero camber. So in some cars, when you come back to zero, to straight, it might be five degrees of camber. It might be two and a half degrees of camber. Um, but that is gonna set it so that it's the most linear steering movement through all of its sweep. So meaning like, when you're in drift, that t that lead tire, sorry, I may not mention that, I mean the lead one, not the chase one being at that camber, just, just focused on the lead, so left and then right, um, which I probably should have said earlier, so if you wanna backtrack now. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, it's gonna make it so that that has zero camber, so it's reducing, it's adding camber coming back and then um, reducing camber as it's moving forward, right? So that amount of movement from your caster and your camber creating that tire lean over from positive to negative, um, sorry, negative to positive, um, makes it so that basically it's as linear and smooth as possible. Um, and also that you're getting, the amount of jacking that you're getting is the same amount of movement that you're getting in camber. So. It makes it so it's the smoothest and easiest to drive. And on a, every car I've ever tried that with as a baseline, it's always worked out to be very close, like within a degree or a degree and a half. So just that balance of how it moves and what it's doing is gonna be key. 
Um, so some cars won't need as much camber. So if you have a double A arm car or something, like you might only have three degrees of static camber and that might be the best it ever drives. Um, and you might have a strut based car that has the way the knuckle is set up, it has a lot of jacking. So maybe it will be, you know, five and a half degrees of front camber. Obviously this is just to get that baseline and show up to the track with something that you know you can make adjustments from and make improvements to fit your driving style. Um, so moving on from the camber aspect of it, being that we want 60% flat on the lead wheel, about zero degrees, you know, give or take a uh, small amount. Um, steer the other way, do the same thing, set that, and hopefully when you go back to center, your shit's not all wonky, because um, it shouldn't be. If everything's set up and balanced correct, um, your camber when you come back should be within a half a degree left to right, um, which is fine. Again, um, we're not trying to do a complete rocket scientist aspect of it. We're going more for how it drives in drift than more of how it drives straight down the road. Okay, next thing we're gonna talk about is the toe and Ackerman on the front of a drift car. Um, so just touching on the toe first, which obviously has affected the Ackerman, <coughs> but the toe, basically, uh, some teams and some people that I've worked with in the past actually ran toe in in the front, which is a very interesting thing to me. Um, I typically run between an eighth and three eighths uh, toe out in the front of a car. Um, and I'll explain why. So if you look at my hands here, when we're towed in, if we're driving down the road and we wanna make a, a left-hand turn, we're gonna turn this and it's not gonna really give a good steering input till about there when the car goes over its uh, zero degree point. Um, also, that amount of tow, because of the way a street car works, it starts to do the opposite and tow out through the sweep. Um, but mostly the fact that when you run a little bit of tow in, there's that delay and that loss of sensitivity in the steering wheel, um, especially for the lower parts of the angle um, from zero to 25 or 30 degrees, which to me is where I want an extra response to be able to put the car where it needs and tell it when to transition, where as when it's towed in, there's that little bit of delay and you gotta do a lot more steering input to make it do things. Um, zero tow, great balance for a street and drift car not just for a straight street car. Straight street car, you definitely want a little bit of toe in. Um, but if it's street and drift car, or street drift car, hopefully not. <laughs> but if you're having fun, I'm down. Um, zero toe. Um, and basically what that's gonna do is, that's gonna give you good turn in, because immediately when you steer, it's over that zero point, and it's getting some, some movement. Uh, but it is gonna be a little bit more uh, twitchy per se, then a little bit of toe in. Um, so it'll have a little bit more response on what you're doing. Uh, zero toe for the street, like I said, it's a little bit like touchy, but not anything like the toe out that I would run in a full drift car. In a full drift car, I would say eighth to three eighths toe out. Anybody running more than that is really masking another problem, which is their Ackerman setting, um, which we're gonna touch on in a second. Um, but yeah, street car or drift car, eighth inch out to three eighths out gives you that instant response in the wheel and it's not so much that the car is like losing its control over being darty because the wheels are you know not going over center and just dragging going down the road so a little bit of toe out gives good response good steering feel um, but it all works in conjunction with Ackerman and Ackerman like I was saying earlier is the amount of difference between the lead tire and the trail tire on a street car, lead, trail, big gap, because this has a smaller arc to go on than this side, because your car's five and a half, six feet wide. So having that arc like that makes it so you can turn to lock and it doesn't scrub the tires and drag them. Um, so street car that you're drifting, um, you'll want pretty much six, uh, let's, let's call it street car uh, that you're actually drifting, you'll want about eight to 12% Ackerman, meaning you have a, eight or 10%, 12% difference from the lead and trail wheel. So 60 degrees here, let's say, you're gonna have um, basically 52 to 56 degrees on this side, okay? Ideal street slash drift car. Um, it's not gonna be ridiculous and be dragging and doing whatnot when you're make, driving through the parking lot. Um, and it's gonna have enough Ackerman spread that when you're at zero uh, degrees of uh, camber, sorry, zero degrees of toe, you're gonna get that split that's good, okay? So now when you're doing the same thing with uh, just a straight drift car, um, we want basically probably five to 8% uh, 
uh, Ackerman. So a little bit less. So 60 on this side and 55 to 58 on this side. So it's closer to that. Um, what the Ackerman does is that trail wheel dictates the pivot of the car. So as your car is like towed out at lock, let's say, so let's say 12%, 10% Ackerman towed out, right? Your car is going to take an arc that is like this, okay? Now, when you have zero Ackerman, your car is going to take an arc that is like this because that inside wheel is going to continue pushing the car in this direction. So think about it like if you're like this, it's going to pull it in. If you're like this, it's going to push it out. So if you're a driver that doesn't like to huck it into the wall and drive it out and dig your way out like with tons of style and you just want to steer yourself out to the wall uh, while you're on the gas, something that's closer to zero Ackerman to basically drop your left hand down like if this was the wall at the bottom of your screen, you drop your left hand down and the car will kind of come out and go around that lock at that angle. So, But if you have a little bit of toe out at lock, um, which was the same about five to eight percent, it'll just create the natural arc through the turn. And if you steer left or right a little bit, it will move a little bit each way, but not aggressively. Zero uh, Ackerman will aggressively do that. Like when you move the wheel and steer, it will pivot and move the car a lot um, because that inside wheel is dictating a little bit of that average on where the car is going. <clears throat> Obviously having toe out at lock two creates a small amount of slip in the front, um, which makes it you can move the wheel and make adjustments and not have it ever look twitchy, if that makes sense. So to me, five to 8% on a drift car for Ackerman, ideal. Um, and then, like I said, eighth to three eighths toe out in the front. It's gonna give you good response, good feel. Um, three eighths and higher is gonna start losing some of that feel while still being twitchy. So, you know, obviously keep that in mind. Um, so cool, we got our toe, we got our caster, we got our camber. Everything's pretty much dialed in the front. Um, we're gonna switch to the rear now. Uh, so the rear of a car is pretty tricky and I'm gonna keep it as simple as possible. Start off with about zero rear camber on a drift car. Um, the reason I say that is because you're gonna have to adjust it because your car gains camber as it sweeps, okay? So some cars that gain camber aggressively will need a little bit more positive camber than a car that kind of goes straight up and down. <clears throat> All you solid axle dudes at this point, camber and toe, you're locked in, so just hang on. <laughs> um, so S chassis, a lot of camber gain. You know, some of these kits that people are making with knuckles and drop knuckles and changing the location points of the control arms, which I'm not going to get into today. Um, those can have better uh, up and down travel, but what's to say it's better, right? Some camber gain is definitely going to be good. And, and depending on how you drive, um, you might want more camber gain than someone else. But the end-all be-all answer for how to set up a balanced car is to have perfect tire wear. So we wanna shove to the track with zero degrees, and this is gonna change from almost every track, this small adjustment. Um, you're gonna change the car probably three quarters or to a, to a degree in each direction at each track if you want this to be perfect. So the amount of camber changing a half degree or so on how it drives is not very much but it does dictate on how you're planting the tire and how much tire you're using. So you go out there and your camber, I say set it to zero and you go drive it and you're wearing the outside of the tire. So you're like, oh man, like this is a little bit too much. My car doesn't have a lot of camber gain at this track. And so on my left side of the car, my car is burning the outside of the tire out. But on my right side, it's burning the inside of the tire. So what I would do is put a half degree in that side to lean it in to get that tire to wear flat. And I put a half degree the other way um, to basically set that to wear flat, where it wears flat. You might end up with a car that's a little bit staggered. Half degree, no big deal. But it will set the tire up to be flat throughout the entire track because you and how you're wearing your tires is definitely showing you the average amount of uh, displacement and camber that you're gaining throughout the track. So. You might be on a bank track where you definitely want to put some more camber in the back right left wheel if it's a right hand sweeper vice versa all those tracks that you go to after the first two sets of tires or even if it, your car lasts 20 or 30 laps on a set of tires you want to make that adjustment so that you can 
level it out and have the tire wear the best it can. Cause that's also going to be giving you the most amount of tire touching the ground for the most amount of time per lap. Okay. So now that your camber is pretty much set, I would always go back to a baseline of whatever that might be. Um, for some cars, it might be slightly positive if it's always wearing the inside of the tire. For some cars, it might be slightly negative if it's always wearing the outside of the tire. We're trying to get a balance basically so that when you show up to every track, you have a setting that's like neutral. Um, and then you make small adjustments from there. On most cars, when you make a camber adjustment, it will also affect the toe. So again, with your tow boards, rechecking those, those settings and making sure that your toe is staying the same when you're making that camber adjustment is gonna be important. The actual physical number on that camber, not very much important at all, in my opinion. Um, you wanna just have the tire wearing flat and then resetting the toe to get it where it needs to be. <clears throat> okay, now, now that the camber set based on tire wear and drifting, because that's the most important thing, we're gonna go ahead and move on to rear toe. Okay, so obviously, again, very different for every car. Some cars gain toe a lot under compression. Some cars lose toe under compression. Um, so what I always recommend doing is, in, before you do any of this setup stuff, with that, once your camber set and you're gonna set toe, I would say remove the spring from your car or unbolt the coilover and just run it through its sweep to see what it's doing, okay? So I would, I would generally say most of the cars in here are gonna bump in a little bit or bump out a little bit, okay? Cars that bump out a little bit can have a little bit more static toe. Cars that bump in a little bit can have a little bit more towards zero. I would say, unless you're running a very, very low horsepower car and you can't get the right tire to spin, that you never want any toe out in the rear, no matter what. Um, the toe out just makes it very, very difficult to drive because it makes it s slide super, super easily, but it also loses that drive, okay? So I would say that no matter what, at its full compression, you would never want it to be bumped out more than let's say, and I would say bumped out, towed out, um, more than like an eighth inch, like at full compression. So if, if you have a car that bumps out under compression, I would say if you bump it all the way and then you check your, you, know, you compress it all the way and you check your bump, uh, your tow out, if it's more than an eighth inch, you're definitely not doing it right. You have to put some more tow in it. <clears throat> so. That's the extreme end of that. The other half of it is if you're bumped in and it, it toes in a bunch under compression, I would say for most everybody watching this, you do not want more than about five eighths toe in at full bump. So obviously some of you guys might have these arms that have different holes and adjustments um, to adjust that toe gain. Some of you guys may not. Um, no matter what, you do not want that thing to go past five eighths of an inch total toe. It's just gonna be start making the car really erratic. And unless you're searching for that last bit of grip and you're already all the way down in tire pressure on whatever you run, and you're already all the way down in the shock and you've already removed the rear bar and you've done everything you can to make rear grip happen, you should not be running past that amount at full bump. Okay, so. How to set the static bump, uh, toe. So basically you wanna have the car be, like I said, you don't really ever want toe out. Um, so you want zero to an eighth inch toe in total in the back to bench line this thing and get it set. Now, if I, like I said, if you have a car that bumps in a whole shitload, then you wanna make sure you're having something that's closer to zero to a, to a 16th. If you have something that bumps out a whole bunch, you know, you wanna, you'll probably run, end up running a little bit more static, could be three eighths uh, of an inch toe in, but a little bit of toe adjustment static is a lot for later on, obviously. Um, so for rear toe, typical most cars, I would say, bam, slam it at an eighth inch toe in, and this is total, both sides together on the toe boards, not per side. Um, I would say that's a perfect uh, position to set the car up in as a baseline. If you get to the track and, you know, you make adjustments to the car and you still for some reason can't fill an outer zone or do whatever, you know, you can make a small adjustment and pull a little bit of toe out, see what that does, see if that helps you because it will take some of the drive out. Because what the toe does is obviously you're towed in a little bit, 
The tires are fighting each other a little bit more. It's planting the tire harder. It's also compressing the tire differently. It's also the angle of the wheel when you're in drift through the sweeper, like we were talking about with the front. It's the same thing if you're towed out in the rear, it's gonna wanna go that average of that. Um, uh, and that lead wheel being towed out like that is gonna basically make it run wider. <clears throat> um, so overall for tow stuff, like I said, eighth inch total, even 16th, like if you have a low power car, you can just go straight to a 16th. Run it through the sweep, see what it does. Obviously if it tows in a whole bunch, then you know you can run a zero or 16th in. If it tows out a whole bunch, you can run a little bit more. We're just trying to get the car to the point where it's at its average about halfway through its sweep. So we're not doing anything crazy drastic. I know some of the guys running like the PBM uh, control arms on S chassis and the vets and all that, like those things on their lower settings are like whack. They have so much toe. And that much dynamic toe change when you're in drift, that's what steers the car. So when you have a ton of that dynamic change, Sure, it might make more grip, but it also makes it way harder to drive. And a happy driver is a fast driver. If you're comfortable and you're making laps and you feel like the car feels amazing, if you speed it up by putting toe gain in it or any of that, it's gonna make you unhappy and make you have more corrections. So we're trying to keep the cars as balanced as possible, obviously. Um, so yeah, so that's how you basically wanna set the toe in the rear. A little bit of toe in, always pretty much for a drift car. Um, but like I said, those extremities you're gonna to wanna to watch out for. So that's pretty much it for the actual alignment itself. Um, taking care of that toe, caster, and camber in the front. Um, if you have a off-track excursion, you hit something or someone hits you, I would immediately, immediately pull out those toe boards and check the toe. Because typically when the camber changes or something's bent, the toe is affected immediately. So if the toe is good, for the most part, the rest of it's typically okay as well. So as long as it's back to where you want. And every time you're doing these kind of adjustments, you always wanna make sure you're on the most level ground as possible. Um, so if you have a shop floor that's level, or if you have a concrete pad somewhere that's level, you wanna get it as close as you can. And like I said, you wanna have your sway bars disconnected whenever you do an alignment. You also wanna make sure your tires have pretty equal pressure across all of them. That will also affect some of it too because the car will lean um, and change the actual suspension dynamic. But like I said, for the crash course aspect of it, um, we wanna make sure, like I said, we'll do a quick overview. Tick a toe out for a drift car in the front, you know, eighth inch, quarter inch, three eighths is fine. Um, and then you want basically the camber to be flat at 60% of your angle so that that caster sweep and how much the camber moves um, is pretty linear across your steering. Um, and you'll have the most contact patch where you're driving the most, right? So that way when you add angle and you get more, that gives you a little bit of jacking, puts a little bit more grip in the back of the car as you're adding angle. Because every time you add angle, you want to find more grip. So that way you can drive at that angle and not have it just spin out. So. So much camber will make it basically that it doesn't have any sort of that jacking. And then zero camber uh, will basically make it so that when you're driving and you have your turn in, um, it's gonna push and, and roll because the tire wants to lean into itself. And when it leans and goes on the outside of the tire, then it's tough to uh, get the car to actually turn in. Another thing to think of too, a lot of guys will do this in road racing. They'll check their sidewalls. In drifting, doesn't work that way. Um, the sidewall in the front is gonna get worn from the car leaning over at lock. So if you drive at high angle all the time, like I drive at high angle all the time and my front tires are like, the outside is flat spotted from dragging the fronts cause they're so like, you know, the caster jack uh, and positive camber at lock. <coughs> it's dragging that tire there. So anyways, I need a drink, he's thirsty. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope it gives you a baseline understanding of the alignment aspect of things and how things work. Um, it's probably a little less complicated than you thought in terms of understanding it, but a lot more complicated in terms of uh, applying it. And that's kind of the whole deal here is uh, just trying to have you guys understand and relate to something that's a little more understanding to the normal person, someone that's not looking at all the numbers and the physics and the 
aspects of all that. Like, you know, these guys online will just give you an alignment sheet that they just ended up taking from some other website and who knows how old it is or how whatever it is. And who knows if that even converts to your car and your setup because every little thing changes. So the easiest way to do it is to sweep everything through its movement and understand a little bit of what's actually happening um, to get a car that's baseline and pretty centered. And then making those adjustments from there, you know what you're leaving and what you're going to. Um, so like a lot of these cars that I'm building now are like sometimes it's the first of those drift cars or the first of this new control arm setup or the first of whatever. So I apply these rules straight to it because that's what gives you the best odds to have a good linear and easy car to drive. And then you can adjust the car from there. Um, but before changing alignment and all that stuff, once you've baselined this, if you've like you watch this video and you go through and you dial your whole car in, like explaining after watching this video and doing it what how to how I'm saying, um, make adjustments to the shocks and the tires and all that um, before you make adjustments to the alignment to find what you want. So if you feel like oh it's a, I did this adjustment and oh, I had a bunch of toe in before, so now I have a lot less grip you know, rather than going back to that toe setting, let's leave it to somewhere that's linear and easier to drive and just drop the tire pressure some, or drop the uh, shocks down a little bit in the rear. Um, let's make adjustments like that before we just gangbusters right back to the actual alignment itself. So let me know what you guys think. Um, this video is strictly for you guys to be able to learn, set your cars up and make drifting better. Uh, that's all these things and replies and everything I do are just to make you guys better at what you're doing, enjoy it more, and not get beat down by a car that's set up poorly. That might be my quote. Don't get beat down by your poorly set up car. <laughs> Watch my videos. Um, but like, don't like, subscribe, don't subscribe, whatever. Let me know at least so I can make improvements. Um, I don't really want to dive into these videos that are super, super complex because they don't fit the masses and it's really, really complicated and really starts screwing people up. So I'll do a lot more videos like this that tell you the basics of it and I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it.